Hi, I'm DJ Ware. On this episode of the Cyber Gizmo, I alluded in my last video on LMDE6 that I was going to talk about what happened with EcryptFS and some of the problems I ran into and what I did to try to address it. So let's go do that. But before we do, I want to thank my sponsors and the members of the channel for their support for this video. Thank you so much for your uh, financial support uh, to help the channel grow, to bring new things and new products to the channel to review as well. So I really appreciate you. If you want to join the, the, uh, uh, the channel as well, there's a channel join button, or you can also take the link that's in the description below to my Patreon page and sign up there. Let's talk about the Ecrypt FS problem. So one of the things you can do is you can, just like you could in LMDE5, is that you could uh, encrypt your home folder. So this is using ecrypt. My home directory has been unencrypted. I can do a mount. And that'll show this right here. So that's the ecrypt. It, what it does is it mounts on top of my home uh, DJ where directory and with an unencrypted version of my home, my home directory. So everything gets saved to that, but once let's just go ahead and log off. So what should happen, what's supposed to happen is that it's, there's a momentary wait because uh, system D when it's, it has a mode called uh, tech tech user and it, that allows it to bring up things specific to my user environment well that's all it, the the thing is you don't want to de re-encrypt your home directory until all of the other system services that are running in the background here for my you know to support my GUI have completed Otherwise, it, they're going to start getting errors. All those services are going to start getting errors uh, because the drive is encrypted and the file that it thought it had open isn't there anymore. So, yeah, it'll be causing all kinds of issues. So I'm going to go ahead and log out. And that starts the counter. Then System D will, as it should, shut down the stuff that it's done with to do is I want to s I want to I would just want to set up a terminal window at least that's what I'm going to do this is 117 okay so the first thing I'm going to do is I'm going to take a look at my mount and down here is our problem now I'm logged off I I I am I'm gone but this, if I go into sudo, yes, your directory is still protected as far as the Linux permissions are concerned, but it is not protected with encryption. As you can see, it's de-encrypted. Uh, I have full, it's fully available to be read. So that's not a desired state. So what's going on here? Well, if I look at, okay, so you'll see <laughs> there's a lot of stuff that's running as me as DJ Ware. Now, according to the rules, Pam won't, Pam won't run the execution script for the, the, the final until all that stuff is gone. So that's a problem <laughs> and that it's not going away. Um, so that's a bug. Uh, that's a bug. And, this is typical with Pam. Pam is a stacking architecture. So this the script that uh, may very well work in certain conditions, but in a normal use it won't because all it takes is for one of those scripts that are in the Pam stack to exit early to do a you know it found an error and it said bye I'm done. And none of that other code that's in the stack will ever get executed. I think that might be what's going on here, but I'm not sure. 
But one of the things I did is I went over here to the PAM directory and I did a grep on ecrypt. And that's what I found. So there's there's four files here that have been modified to include the the library for Pam for uh, Pam ecrypt fs auth is valid that's one where you would definitely want it the other one is in session it could very well be that one of these is turning it off and the other one is turning it right back on again so and, and so <laughs> let's just get rid of that confusion right now so what I want to do is I want to get the common password up. And let's go find it. And we're just going to comment it out. And the other one we're going to do is non-interactive. All right, so let's uh, let's reboot. And the reason I want to reboot is I want to close. I want to get that in, that un, that mount out. Now I could just run that. There is a script that will unmount that that directory, but that's I still have services running, and I don't really want to. I don't want to, and you know, have a problem with it trying to write something into those directories that is no longer valid. So all right, let's. Let's go back in as pi. It's probably back up by now. All right. Now let's try our mount. Make sure it's not there. And it's not. You don't see it anywhere. All right. It's gone. So let me just create another window here. Now this time I'm going to do a, a tail. I want to see what it's doing. So maybe I'll work on that. Okay, so you'll you notice that there was a whole bunch of stuff that happened here when I logged in. Uh, let's just yeah, see all this see all this starting stuff. There, there's my user runtime for me. I'm user 1000, uh, DJ Ware. So this this is system D starting up its user process. It, it has a user mode, and it's bringing up all the processes that it needs for me. So let's take a look. Yeah, there's 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 a few. Yeah, there's a few. Not a lot, but there's a few um, running under this. Now, I'm I, granted, I am running only as uh, SSH. So, all right, next thing. Let's get out of here. Let's do a mount. Make sure that yep, there's my there's my unencrypted home directory. So I should be able to see. All the stuff in here. Let's let's just create a little test file. There we go. So that's good. And the next thing I want to do is let's let's tail the syslog again. I'm going to give a little bit of a gap this time. Let's shut off. Let's exit. So the thing that you should should notice here is that things don't happen right away. And that's because there are timers there. Boom. There are timers in the system that kind of say, well, wait a second. He might come back. Maybe he's just logging off and back on again because maybe he had a problem. But so and it's going to try to hold the session open for there's a timer. I think I think on normally it's 96 seconds. But I think I saw a note in the Linux Mint forums that they reduced it to 24, which that's fine. Whatever it is, it is. I'm not not here to criticize those guys. They do an excellent job on what they do. So right here, you'll notice this is my gap, and then we'll see that this is being shut down by the 1000 service again. This is system D that is doing that. 
And then it starts to call through all of these targets that it has set up. It's going to shut down pipe wire and D-bus and all the stuff that you saw that was running. So hopefully one of those <laughs> was the PAM modules. So let's do a mount. Let's see if we fixed it. And yes, we have. You'll notice that it's, well, you can test it. We can check. So I'm going to have to do a sudo home DJ where, and you'll notice that now I have this default message that eCrypt creates for my home directory. It says, access your private data desktop and readme.test text. Now, now you probably will want to get rid of that at some point because that's saying, hey, I've got an encrypted directory here. So yeah, you, you might want to put something else in there like, you know, your latest tiddlywink score or your latest tic-tac-toe game, but you know, whatever. But um, that is unencrypted. That's the unencrypted default directory. So my directory has been re-encrypted. So, all right, let's see if things work. Okay, let's go back and do a tail on syslogging it. Let's see if this still works, or did I break it? Did I, it's always good to check again to make sure that you didn't break the thing. And yes, so I can do a mount from here to show it to you. It's right there. So there's my mount. This is working better, but there's still an issue with this. Uh, and the issue has to do with the GUI side of things. So I'm a little concerned that when I'm running under the GUI, that I might be creating a, a problem for myself in that I, let me just show you what it is. Okay, let me just get out of here. I didn't see it there for a minute. It's right there. The mount directory is right there. Okay. So we're good. Everything's good so far. We've got our directory unrolled. It's it's unencrypted. And there it's going again. It's hanging on me again. All right, I'm going to log out. Okay. gone it's it is gone that's working it's re-encrypting my drive so now let's do <laughs> but look <laughs> this is the other problem to me, this is not what I would desire. There's no need for these sessions. These sessions are running under my ID. They're attached to, let's do it long form and then you can see. So you can see that the owner of this is 1049, which is system D. It's the minus, it's the tac tac user. So there's no need for those to remain up. They can go bye bye. They're no, they're no longer needed. So that's what I'm a little concerned about. My workaround has some holes in it. And to be honest, it'd be really good if this stuff would just go away. Technically, technically, the PAM module should not have come down at all if those were running. If anything was still left up and running, it should not have unencrypted the directory. So... Anyway, that's all I had about that. I'm yeah, that's I'm gonna drop that back in the developer's hands because uh, I have a workaround. It is not the best workaround. It may cause problems. So take it on, play with this on a system that you aren't using for live data. That eCrypt has never been my favorite. I mean, it's not that it doesn't encrypt well, but yeah, it does weird. It 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 folds into parts of the system that are notoriously poor at their consistent execution. How's that? 
It's not the fault of eCrypt. It's not even the fault of Linux Mint. We've kind of looked at eCryptFS a little bit. I'll probably talk a little bit more about it in context with this discussion. But, you know, given the fact that I'm just not satisfied with the workaround I found, I'm not satisfied with eCryptFS as the right way of encrypting my data on, on the disk. Yeah, let's talk about some of the alternatives that you have, some of the things that you can explore. I'm not specifically making any recommendations, but I will be showing you today what I do. So, yeah, let's just put it that way. Right or wrong, this is what I do. But before we jump off into all this, there is a lot of terminology, a lot of standards, and a lot of certifications that you need to understand before we do that. Otherwise, you won't have any idea what we're talking about. The first one you're going to run into is something called EAL. And there's usually a number after it, and that is the evaluation assurance level. So that the value that's assigned to that is based on the completion of a specific set of tests. Those tests are compiled as part of the common criteria security evaluation. First, that was implemented in 1999, so it's been around a while, nothing new. There are levels that are assurance levels from EAL1 all the way up to EAL7. Does that mean that if I'm at EAL1, that I have, a, I have something that's less secure than something that's, say, EAL4, 5, or even 7? No, it, it doesn't mean that at all. The number of associates itself with the, the, the type of tests that are performed. And they get harder as you go up. So you have a set of base criteria that you're adding on to as you go up in these different layers. So they, they take longer and longer and longer to complete, obviously. The U.S. Uh, Government Accountability Office, or the GAO, they did a study, this has been back a ways, on how much time it takes to complete, on average, various EAL uh, evaluation. So they looked at EAL 1 through 4, and they produced a chart on what the range was for projects they had open during the time frame of the study. An EAL 4, for example, would take uh, between 10 and 25 months, whereas, say, an EAL 1 might take between 1 and 3 months. So you can see that the level of effort goes up horrendously, now, they didn't go beyond that. They didn't go to 5, 6, and 7. Yeah, those probably would be longer testing criteria than the study period covered, So, which is always something they run into, right, whenever you're doing that type of study. So, yeah, so it just becomes tougher the higher up you go. The other one you're going to run into is FIPS 197. What the heck is that? So NIST, uh, the National Institute of Standards and, and Technology, they have a, a set of documents for defining various things. They could be defining tests. They could be defining standards. They may even wholesale define what an encryption algorithm does. And FIPS 197 is one of those latter ones where it defines the Advanced Encryption Standard, or AES. That was introduced in November of 2001, uh, it was superseded in, on May 9th of this year, 2023. In there is the, all of the information about what needs, what, how to implement, what it has to do in order to meet the AES encryption standard. So, for example, you'd have to have AES 128-bit uh, key links, 192-bit key links called AES 192, or AES-256, and of course that's 256 uh, bit links. The other one you're going to run into is the FIPS-140-2, and also its counterpart-3. Those two address the security requirements for cryptographic modules. They were introduced in May of 2001, this particular one, 140-2, it was superseded by 140-3 on March the 22nd, 2019. So 
they uh, the FIP, the NIST has shut down testing for compliance for FIPS 140-2. But if you have a device that was certified prior to the supersede date. Uh, that's already gone through the testing for FIPS 140-2, you're fine. And and those will continue to be allowed until September the 22nd, 2026, and in which case you'll have to go back and do testing for 140-3. So 140-3 is the new standard. It's the one that they are doing uh, testing on. You're probably going to run into is XTS AES. It's, it's written as XTS-AES. You may also see it flipped where AES is first and then dash XTS. They, they look equivalent to me. I'm not sure if that specifies the order that AES is done first and then XTS or XTS is done first and then AES. Uh, yeah, I mean, I'm not sure that matters, but what is it? So AES-XTS is a block cipher mode for storage devices. Is it part of the FIPS 197 standard for AES? No. No, it's not. Um, this one is an IEEE standard, and the standard that IEEE conforms to is, is officially known as 1619-2007. The reason they developed this was that after applying AES to certain types of data, they found that that data was taking a lot more room on disk. And what does XTS stand for? And I don't know how they come up with these names, but here we go. This is what it officially means. XEX, one of those uh, acronyms within an acronym, uh, is, is the tweakable block cipher with ciphertext, and the S part is stealings, stealings. Uh, I, typical engineers, they would come up with that. So, yeah, okay. So it, w w so XTS is a encryption standard by itself. AES is an encryption standard by itself. When you combine the two, you get ATS XTS or XTS AES. Generally, XTS is either 128 bit or 256, and generally they only apply it to AES. 128 or 256, mostly 256. Because what they're really trying to do here is increase the bit length so it falls within a block boundary. So you, if you combine 128 with 256, you get a key length of 384 bits. If you combine XTS-256 with AES-256, you get a 512-bit key length. The other, the other thing you're going to run into is something called encryption types. And this runs afoul of, it's, it's one of those areas where marketing has begun clouding this uh, with different definitions. So the official ones, the official definitions that I learned were software encryption. And of course, that means that in order to do the encryption and decryption and management of the keys, I have to have the machine CPU involved at all times to do that. Hardware encryption means that the storage device or the device I'm talking to has built-in hardware that does the encryption, decryption, and the management of the keys all independently of the operating system and the CPU. So this is all done on the directly on the device. Now the mixed mode part. One that's come in is called self-encryption. Well, generally speaking, and I, I say this with tongue-in-cheek, generally speaking, that means the same as hardware encryption. But I've already seen examples where certain companies, I won't mention their names, but certain companies that have called their devices self-encryption that are using a combination of the CPU and the device. So they manage the keys on the CPU. They manage the encryption and decryption on the device. Uh, I don't know if that's just because of processing limitations to the controller that's normally on those devices and they didn't want to upgrade. I don't know. But marketing has a tendency to cloud things over time. So watch out for that one. If you encounter that, dig deeper. Make sure that it is a hardware encrypted device if that's what you're looking for. Otherwise, you may be taking cycles away from your CPU 
in order to manage things on those types of devices. So in the last one, I don't didn't want to okay, I really don't want to include this one, but just for completeness, I am. This is ATA security. This is part of the SATA standard um, that's been around with us for a long time. That that uh, the ATA security is nothing more than a password lock. It basically prevents you from mounting the drive until you give it a password and then it mounts the drive up for you. It doesn't do encryption. It doesn't do decrypt and decryption either. So the device stores the data unencrypted and it retrieves it unencrypted. So it's not really, I would really consider this an option for, for the topic that we're talking about here. So I would, I would recommend just avoid that one. I don't think too many people have ever used that, but it is there. Don't confuse it with Lux. That's not Lux. <laughs> Lux doesn't work that way. All of these things, let's just compare them real quick. E, let's start with EcryptFS. So EcryptFS provides an actual file system. So it's a, but it, they, but they call it a stackable cryptographic file system. So it's kind of a special one. So what is it, stackable? What do you mean by stackable? Well, it means that eCrypt can, I can, I can create a file system with any, can be ext4, can be xfs, it can be any number of them. So I can pick and choose what I want, but eCrypt will just slap itself right down on top of an existing file system and work. And it has tools that are in it that allow me to migrate the mount underneath in the old and the original file system onto eCrypt and it will encrypt the data that was say in my home directory for example and store it within this new structure. The eCrypt uses AES 128 bit for encryption. The other one of course is Lux. Lux is a uh, it is a device or a file system oriented mount and Lux wants it's it really is meant to protect boot level uh, uh, encryption. So it encrypts the disk. Veracrypt, by comparison, that is a free and open source software package that is meant to allow you to create and maintain on the fly encrypted volumes and data storage devices. If you choose, you can encrypt the entire device as well. Veracrypt manages the encryption as the data, it encrypts the data as it is written to the disk. So the, da the, the data on disk is always encrypted. So if somebody were to, to rip that volume out of there and somehow try to pry open uh, those folders that are protected by Veracrypt, they'll find the data is, it remains encrypted no matter what. The only time they can be unencrypted is if the file is open and being used. So the other side of it is that it decrypts the data, Veracrypt decrypts the data as the data is being loaded into memory from the disk. It also, Veracrypt permits all the standard IOs to work under Linux. There's, it doesn't need a translator, it doesn't need a conversion. Uh, you can copy files freely from an unencrypted volume to a Veracrypt volume and back, and it will handle the encryption and decryption as it moves it. Where did Veracrypt come from? It, it has its roots in TrueCrypt, which was the really the first personalized encryption mechanism that we had for both Unix and Linux. So yeah, it go, this goes back to 7.1a. I, I don't think, I've heard it, it labeled as a fork, but I've never seen that word used on the Veracrypt site. They've always used the word based on TrueCrypt. TrueCrypt had kind of, it, it, you might hear some people say it was open source, and kinda, sorta. It didn't, it didn't, it had its own uh, open source license, but there were some gotchas in that license that you had to be careful of because if you overstepped it, they could sue you uh, if you were, you know, distributing it for pay and blah, blah, blah. So yeah, there yeah, it was not truly free and open source, but it had its kind of its own. Doesn't matter now, TrueCrypt is dead. Uh, there isn't anybody that's uh, actively, that I know of, actively working on it. So what can I do with Veracrypt? What kind of uh, algorithms will it handle? So it does do AES, but it also handles more. It handles Camella. It handles uh, Kozmeshik, I think Kozmeshik. 
and Serpent, also Two Fish, and Cascade of Ciphers. As far as the hashing mechanisms you can use, uh, Blake 2, and that's 256. Either SHA-256 or 512 can be used. Also, Whirlpool and Stebog can be used as well. So you have your choice of things there. It's widely supported. It runs on Windows 11, 10, Windows Server 2016, Mac OS from 11 up to 13. I tested it with 14. Seems to work fine. Runs on Linux, either on x86 or ARM64. Runs on FreeBSD 64 and Raspberry Pi OS. Either the 32 or 64-bit versions will work. One thing about VeraCrypt, though, one of the limitations is that you should pay attention to. There's a chapter in the manual that talks about avoiding third-party file extensions before using VeraCrypt. And those have to do with certain software on Windows that do direct access to the device that bypass all of the layers that VeraCrypt would be running in. So potentially you could be writing data that that is encrypted by VeraCrypt that the, the software is writing directly to that file and causing corruption. So yeah, they talk about it. So go read that if you're interested in using it on the Windows platform. There is also something like this. This is a hardware key. There's a number of these that are provided uh, a hardware key means that there is a processor here and a battery and some memory that you can use to manage this device. Both from the key strength to uh, also there's an admin mode where you can modify parameters like uh, how long the key should be, whether it should have an alphanumeric character in it or not, and where that should be present. Also, you can specify like things like how many uh, unsuccessful attempts you can allow before this device gets reset back to factory defaults, which would delete your keys, it would delete your passwords, and it would delete your files, basically giving you the device back the way you got it from the factory. So uh, the other thing is uh, it, it, can, it is IP6, which means you can submerge it in one and a half meters of water for 30 minutes. Uh, it can be run over by a, a two and a half ton truck and it'll withstand uh, dust, it, dusty environments as well. Now, I think the water and the dust comes from this seal. There's a little rubber gasket that runs around this thing here that seals against this. So I, I don't know if there's any protection once it's out of the case because obviously you have openings here with the USB that it would allow dirt and water to get into the device. Uh, the other thing is the, the, the processor is protected by epoxy. It is a very hard resin and a high temperature resin. So it would not be easy to remove that epoxy from the chip to gain access to the uh, drive underneath of it without probably destroying the board it was sitting on. It did go through testing. This is a, a FIPS 140-3 compliant device. It's also EAL5+. Plus on the processor. So it's gone through a number of those certifications. There's also been independent security uh, researchers that have uh, done work on this as well to determine whether or not it's as good as the company says it is. So yeah, th they offer this device also with uh, protection, a protection coding over these numbers that prevent imprinting on the numbers, uh, fingerprint or wearing of the numbers that over time. So I don't know if you have a home security system that's fairly old, but you may have noticed that your over time your your password is kind of ingrained in the numbers that you've pushed all the time. That this uh, tries to alleviate that problem. So how does this work? Uh, let me just try to get it up here. And the first thing it'll do is it'll if if I if I cycle through this is supposed to be red, and that red means that it is locked. It's protected by the password. So I can I can then hold down this key, and it will start flashing blue and green. Those mean that it's waiting. Green means I'm waiting to unlock your admin, which is the blue one ad, admin, 
And it's saying, I'm waiting for the admin password before I allow you in. Once it goes back to red, if I hold down both of these together, it'll start blinking with all three. That means it's waiting for the user password to be entered. You can, you can specify either the admin or the user if you want as read only. I wouldn't recommend doing both because then you would be able to delete the file, but you, I'm not even sure it would allow that, but uh, you can specify that those that the data say in a user mode is on is uh, read only. That would allow you to distribute the key, share it with other people without them being able to modify what's on it. So yeah, if you wanted to do that and they could copy off the data, you could do that. Other than that, uh, is it faster than say a normal USB that's of similar type? No, <laughs> no. I, again, I have not seen, I have not seen yet where security is faster than a straightforward unencrypted drive. Yeah, the, the security just doesn't work that way. So I created kind of this tier one and tier two list. Let me just explain that. So first of all, these devices are not for our cryptocurrency. So, so don't don't use these as your wallet. Companies such as Apricom, the Aegis has been around a while. You might find uh, Crucial has, I think it's called the X9, X9 Pro. Uh, those are what they refer to as self-encrypted drive devices. Now, I couldn't find any place on their site where they talk about certifications or compliance. So I don't think, see things like FIPS 197, FIPS 140-3, or even the common criteria EAL. So I don't see anything like that. That's why it's on my tier two, because I'm just not sure what they do. Data Locker does have FIPS compliance. The only reason I put them on tier two is because gigabyte for gigabyte, they're the most expensive device that I found. Uh, iStorage is what the data sure is, this one. And Kingston has several in their iron key. Um, there's some that just do... Uh, FIPS 197, there's some with processors that do FIPS 120, 140-2 uh, and some that do FIPS 140-3. You'll find the same is true of data uh, of uh, iStorage as well. So pay attention when you're looking at it, uh, what type of things is being offered. Typically, you'll find the keyboard is a good sign that there's a, uh, a processor on board. Yeah, that's doing the encryption. So it's not always the best way of identifying it, but typically that's the one way of looking at it. Samsung has their, also has self-encrypted SSDs, like the T7 Touch is one of them. I'm not sure all of the details behind that. They don't share them with us. I don't see any certifications beyond the normal electronics ones. So that's why they're on the tier two. I'm just not sure what they provide. If you know of others, let me know in the comments below. These are just the ones that I have used. Um, I have an old iron key. It's I think it's from 2010, something like that. It's, it goes back a ways. Um, probably one of the first AES implementations that I've ever seen. You can also get M.2 devices, SSDs, hard drives, so you have kind of a plethora of ways to do that. All of them, though, are external devices. Uh, now, I did notice that Crucial does talk about enterprise drives that they have for the enterprise that are encrypt that do provide encryption, but I didn't spend any time looking at those. Anyway, that's all I had for today. I hope you enjoyed this video. Uh, let me know in the comments below what you use uh, for encryption, if anything. Uh, there's a lot of choices for software on Linux. I'm just covering the ones I use. It's not a recommendation. I would have no idea what your needs are, and they're more than likely way different than mine. So, hope to see you again in the next one.